welcome to Manufacturing Hub. Uh, we are here on a Monday in most of the world, but if you guys know Francisco, you know he's in Australia, so he's tomorrow. It's already tomorrow today. It's always a very confusing time uh, when he and I have the conversation, and for whatever reason, he refuses to give me the Powerball numbers uh, so that we could go do some some really fun stuff with, with all of that money. Uh, but no, as we as we go jump in, we're doing something a little bit special, a little bit different today. We're going to talk about energy monitoring and on a, on a live build. If you guys are new to Manufacturing Hub, we generally go off uh, every Wednesday at four o'clock East Coast time. So th this time every Wednesday and have conversations this month. We're all talking about data driven sustainability. Uh, data driven sustainability is very much IIoT with a purpose. The last couple of weeks, we've had a bunch of conversations around energy monitoring and different ways that pe that facilities can monitor energy and save money and perhaps increase throughput while doing that. Uh, and we just so happen to have been working on this very first manufacturing of live build that you guys are seeing now for a number of weeks or months or perhaps longer. Um, and, and it fit in just too perfectly uh, to not include this as part of our data driven sustainability uh, theme. Uh, so um, if you guys no. If, if you guys don't know the show, we are very open. Uh, we love to do our very best to bring in chat and comments. So hi to Francisco and hi to Rafi. Um, as we go through the uh, as, as we go through this, uh, please feel free to go ahead and drop your comments in chat. We will do our very best in order to go through the process of answering those questions and getting those questions in. And beyond that, we do our very best to make sure that those questions get answered where applicable uh, after after the live show. So, oh, poor Hank. So, so Hank has been stuck in Newfoundland uh, for the last like four or five days, but we shouldn't feel really bad because he's in some of the best mar music and bar scenes in probably the entire world. So hello, Hank. Uh, I hope you're holding down the bar stools for us. Uh, having said that, and without further ado, I'd like to officially welcome everyone to Manufacturing Hub. As I said earlier, this is a special energy monitoring live build. I am Dave. This guy over here is Vlad. We've got a bunch of guests, uh, Francisco and Esteban and Richard. Uh, and we're going to go through the process of doing a live build from five different countries and three continents. And I know you're saying, Dave, this kind of sounds crazy. Those were the exact words Vlad said to me. But but as I said, we, we've been working on this for a while and we want to leverage the ability to develop in a bunch of different places, leverage MQTT, leverage the cloud services. And so we're excited to go ahead and talk about that. Uh, when we were talking about energy monitoring, one of the kind of core tenants that we wanted to, or I guess a couple of core tenants that we wanted to make sure to hit is that it's the application that is more important or kind of the, the desire of what to do is more important th than the particular pieces that you're going to have. We'll, we'll go through some of the hardware and software that we're going to use, but we kind of wanted to highlight that you can do it on bit, most plat most platforms have the ability to do some sort of energy monitoring. Uh, and so you shouldn't let the fact that we have picked particular pieces of hardware and stop software stop you from going and creating that sustainability and those different gains as is possible. Uh, and the second core tenant is that we wanted to talk about is we wanted to talk about business cases or applications, right? There, it doesn't necessarily make sense to go do anything unless you have a reason to go ahead and do it. So talking with Francisco, as we're getting ready to run up to this build, uh, we wanted to kind of highlight a, a couple of different corporation sizes and styles. And it's our goal to kind of showcase how the, how these applications can be leveraged right there, right? So first is a mid-sized organization, right? And so Corpax is spending a, a significant to them amount of money each month, typically in the ten to $30,000 a month on a variable power cost. And they most of the time want to know where and how they're spending this money and see how they can go ahead and spend less, right? So, so that is your typical small to medium manufacturing uh, corporation. Uh, the, the second one is kind of a large corporation, and, and I've dealt with some similar applications, right? Especially large corporations, you know, many times they're in the, you know, seven figures, so maybe a million dollars a month in an energy bill. And lots of times it, it's very, it's a very variable number. And because it is so variable, they don't particularly know how much anything is going to cost 
before they get to the process of getting that bill. And th that's a really bad and poor way to run a business, right? So many times those companies want to be able to go visualize their bill, understand what they're going to spend, you know, plus or minus perhaps 5%, and then go figure out ways to go reduce that cost. And many times I've seen those organizations also have co-generation. And if they've got co-generation, they want to make sure that they're running their generators at the point in time that they can go save themselves the most money. Uh, so having said that, I want to go kick it over to, uh, I want to go kick it over to Francisco. He has put together this beautiful PowerPoint uh, to go kind of talk about architecture and, and a little bit more. Francisco. Thank you, Dave. Hi, everyone. How are you? Well, uh, let's get this rolling, I guess. <laughs> so uh, when we were talking with Dave a couple months ago about, you know, uh, building something uh, live, basically, uh, we came up with this uh, really small idea at the very beginning of just, you know, developing an on-spot application that can connect to some energy monitoring devices and, you know, keep it keep it small, keep it under control, and uh, and basically uh, keep it in interesting for, you know, these kind of like on-premises local applications. But then, uh, you know, as Dave and I are, we kept talking and we kept talking until we end up with this model that I'm going to uh, present to you guys today. And this is the whole idea of the development that we're going to be doing in the next minutes. Okay, so the um, so let me walk you through the architecture that we are going to be uh, developing along this uh, along these uh, next minutes, as I mentioned before. So how this is going to work, and the whole purpose of this is that if you leverage what we are going we are going to be doing over the next minutes, you know, like globally speaking, it means that it you know if you're thinking about something local you know, it can be done, <laughs> definitely can be done. So the architecture that we are going to be uh, working with today and the different technologies that we are going to be using along this deployment are, are as follows. So let's start from the very bottom, from the kind of like the, uh, as we are well aware, the OT side of the of things here. Um, uh, so in this case, what we are dealing with at the moment is we have, uh, oh, let me, Turn on the laser pointer here. So we have an up to 22, a group Rio EMU device here uh, in Australia, where, which is where I'm at, actually at my house. It's conveniently located in my kitchen. And it's going to be uh, getting some power, uh, uh, measuring some power from my kettle. So at the end of the, at the end of the of the development, I might have a cup of tea just to celebrate. And um, and uh, you know we have the the device here. Um, and it's going to be configured so it measures something locally and sends that data uh, to an MQTT broker in the cloud. In this case, we're trying to prove the point uh, that this can be hardware agnostic, but we are using some of the lead brands in the market, right? Uh, so uh, in that regard, as I mentioned before, we are using the Opto22 Group EMU uh, device. I have to uh, stop here and thank uh, iControls and Glenn Fry because he he was uh, kind enough to allow us to use the device for this demo. So uh, we have configured the up to 22 device already. So you know the the, the current transformers and the voltages and everything has been uh, pre-wired and it's already configured. So we already have those measurements in the in the device. We are not going to be covering that uh, along the this, this development. And through MQTT, we are going to configure that connection to this MQTT broker in the cloud. So where is the MQTT broker at the moment? To tell you the truth, I have no clue. Because we chose to go with, uh, uh, then again, with something that's available for everyone in um, in the world, which is HiveMQ in this case. Uh, so we are going to be using that uh, demo broker to publish our, our, our data from the device uh, or from the devices uh, in case that uh, we would like to make this uh, a little bit bigger but uh, that's uh, that's the first step to publish the information to publish the data and the data is going to be uh, uh, being published on that mqtt broker then um uh, then what we're going to do is going to use ignition as the uh, development platform for an application right that allows us to um, subscribe to that data from the mqtt broker into the ignition gateway and uh, we are going to uh, use Ignition, you know, as, as the leading platform as it is for uh, this type of unleashing data in, um, uh, initiatives. And we are going to start historizing that data uh, into a, a MySQL server. These two uh, servers are hosted in the cloud at the moment, as um, 
as uh, Dave well pointed out before these uh, these broadcasting, these servers are located in Ecuador at the moment, uh, and uh, and uh, basically we are going to be uh, developing that application remotely because these are cloud hosted, and uh, we are going to have Richard actually connecting into the into the ignition gateway remotely, uh, as, as I mentioned, using, of course, uh, secure means to do it, like VPNs and that kind of stuff. And we are going to be developing our, uh, a application that we don't want to um, uh, go any further than kind of like the out of the box, uh, uh, kind of like um, approach. So we are going to be using kind of like standard components we're not going to be jumping into anything like too customized because we want to prove the point that this can be done right and it doesn't will it won't take like uh, uh, like uh, some nuclear science to be able to deploy this okay so uh, we're going to be using basically out of the box type components uh, on this application and once we have that application uh, uh, developed then we are going to give it a test and we are going to have five people logging into that application and watching the, the data that we're collecting. And that's going to be Dave in the US, uh, Vlad in Canada, uh, Stefan, who is currently in Germany, uh, Richard, who is in Ecuador, and me, who are in Australia. So that's the whole concept of what we are going to be doing today. So um, just to go with uh, uh, with Vlad's mood, I'm just finger crossing that everything goes uh, goes right and that, that everything works as expected. So. Uh, with that Francisco, being said, we have yeah. a. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. We have a good question in the chat. Phil is asking. Uh, he's saying, "I understand HiveMQ is very popular for lots of reasons, but if a company is already invested in another cloud service, Azure, GCP, AWS, couldn't they really use any broker they want?" Of course, and the the answer is completely and totally a hundred and ten percent yes. <laughs> and that's the whole point here. You know, as long as as you have a, a um, an MQTT compliant broker, you know, like. Uh, and if you're if, if you're thinking about using a Sparkplug B, as long as that broker is uh, is compliant to version 3.1 uh, 3.1 of the of the MQTT protocol, everything is going to be fine. It can be high, we chose HiveMQ in this case just because it's easy to use, it's easy to start up your account, and and it's free, <laughs> which for the live buildup was a really uh, a really good idea. But then you can jump into different uh, different approaches if you want to use any other cloud uh, provider, you know to to use their MQTTA broker approach, or if you want to implement your own with Mosquito or you know whatever you want. Ignition also has a module uh, based on Sirius Link uh, uh, technologies, uh, which is the, the Ignition the distributor, which is an MQTT broker as well. So here the options are quite broad. So it's, uh, it's just a matter of choosing you know the one of your preference, basically. OK. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, no worries. So as I was saying, the last thing that I'm going to uh, point out on this on this architecture is that uh, we can actually, you know, if we look at the concept, at the moment we're going to be working just with one with one up to 22 device. But the moment that we prove that the architecture works, you can grow as much as you want and having devices wherever you want, because that's one of the, the main advantages of, of using MQTT, right? It's low bandwidth, it's, really, it's extremely efficient, it's um, a report uh, a report by exception, you know. So uh, these other uh, power meters that we have even taken away the brand out of it, because as long as it's MQTT Sparkle V compliant, it can be any type of device. Of course, we have chosen up to 22 because it's one of the lead brands in the market. And I think one of the coolest devices out in the market as well uh, regarding uh, how versatile it is and, you know, all the features that it has. But then again, it can be anything that you probably currently have, or um, or if you're looking into implementing your implementing your, your own architecture, it can be anything you want, as long as it's MQTT, Sparkplug V compliant. Uh, if you want to take away the pain of uh, scripting and you know doing things in the middle, that's what Sparkplug V brings into the table, right? So, OK, so that being said, uh, let me uh, just walk you through a little bit of the agenda that we're going to have for this uh, development. So. Uh, we are going to be working in, uh, in two instances. The first one, of course, it's on the sensor level, on the EMU uh, side. And this is where we are going to be uh, configured then the uh, Opto22 uh, monitoring device. As I mentioned before, we're just going to cover the data service part of the, of the configuration. So we are actually sending the data and connect it into our HiveMQ instance. Then we're going to switch over to, uh, and that's going to be performed by me here in Australia. 
uh, in Brisbane. And uh, then once I configure the device that I set that's conveniently located in my kitchen at the moment, then um, uh, I'm going to switch over to Richard, who's going to be developing an application from scratch on Ignition. We are going to be using a couple of the, you know, like pre-canned options uh, for navigation and that kind of stuff, so we don't lose time on, on, on those regards. But we are going to start from zero, basically from a, uh, um, from a brand new, just installed uh, instance of a gateway, OK? And what we're going to do is we're going to con uh, configure that gateway in order to be able to connect and subscribe to that data in the HiveMQ uh, broker. Then we're going to con uh, configure as well a database connection to a MySQL instance so we can actually historize the data that we're, going we're getting from the device. Uh, and then we're going to jump into the application development itself, the, the visualization part of it. So we are going to start with a, a, you know some UDT creation because the whole point here is that we are able to have like a, a, a data model, right? A, a, a data entity within the, the application that allows us to actually have any type of device on the, uh, uh, on the field, basically. And we can easily address that and dynamically in most, in most of cases uh, address those needs. So uh, we can create as many devices as we want dynamically. And for that, we're going to cover some reference tags, parameters, and tag history and configuration. Uh, and then after this, uh, we're going to jump into the visualization part of that UDT, which is going to be a template view for monitoring devices on perspective. And we're going to be covering parameters, tag bindings, and some basic styling. Uh, and then last but not least, we're going to take this view and uh, create a main view to display any number of meters that you may have in your application. Of course, we are very humble and we're going to have only one, but the concept, uh, <laughs> but the concept is going to be strong enough, I hope, for you to see that you can have as many devices as you may require in your application, right? And um, last but not least, we are going to uh, modify the navigation framework so we can actually uh, navigate into the view that we created. And then we're going to use one of the pre canned historian uh, um, views that come with uh, Ignition by default. And we are going to take a look at some data that's coming in real time from Australia uh, in the different uh, instances of the application. So that covers the agenda for today. You know, uh, you see that I took a few minutes just to cover the agenda, so it's a lot that we have to do. Um, so, we, so without any further ado, let's. Uh, Let's get our hands into, into action, OK? So uh, as I mentioned before, let's start with the, uh, with the sensor level. So let's start configuring that uh, uh, Groove MQ. So uh, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen here. <clears throat> oh. There you go. I hope you can see my, uh, there we go. my browser at the moment. Perfect. So as you can see, I have the group manage, which is the portal that we that we configure the the <clears throat> the up to twenty two EMU from. So uh, if I go into the IO channels, you can see that I have all the wiring pre done, as I mentioned before. So we have some really basic measures at the moment uh, because we have no load active at the moment. I will activate it uh, as I mentioned before when we have the application developed. So we have we have some real world measures uh, measurements, but. Uh, you know, if I go into the phases, we have voltage uh, measurement at the moment. Uh, current is, of course, zero uh, and that kind of stuff. But we have data that we can start uh, delivering into the cloud. OK, so in order to deliver this, uh, uh, this data into the cloud, I need to go into the data service portion of the group manage management uh, tool. And uh, the first thing that I need to do is I need to scan the devices, uh, you know, uh, enable the, the devices to be scanned by the, by the data service here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to enable this um, uh, this service here or this feature here, and uh, you know I'm just going to leave the MQTT Spark plug option enabled. I at this point I don't care about the other two because we're not going to be using them. And you know as a, uh, as everything in life the up to the, the up to 22 in the end is a compute module, right? So if I enable things that we are not going to be using, I'm actually wasting compute resources. So I'm going to leave them off. And uh, I'm going to just enable the MQTT Spark plug here and save the configuration. And then uh, once I have set the device to be able to be scanned by the, by the data service, I'm going to configure the MQTT portion of it. So as you can see, I have the uh, possibility of add an MQTT Spark plug uh, service here, so uh, a configuration. I'm going to click on it. 
And uh, of course, I'm going to enable it. And I'm going to provide some, you know, some of the uh, basic um, parameters that uh, the <clears throat> that the namespace requires to be able to work, right? So in the group ID, I'm going to go with something as creative as build up 2023. <laughs> uh, the edge node ID, I'm going to get even more creative, and I'm going to go with node one. Mm -hmm. And um, and last but not least, I'm uh, 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 well. That's pretty much everything that I have to configure here. But I have to add the MQTT broker. So to add the MQTT broker, I'm going to click here, and it's going to require the address for the broker and some username and passwords. And you know, all these settings are coming from wherever your broker is. So in this case, as I mentioned before, we are working with um, with HiveMQ. So this is my my uh, my interface to manage my my free broker. I still have it for a couple of gigas more. Um, and what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to copy the, the, the URL for that uh, uh, for that um, uh, uh, MQTT broker. And of course, I have to take a look at which port is enabled, which in this case, as you can see, it's the 8883. OK, so uh, I'm going to go back into my uh, into my uh, group here. And I'm going to paste the, that address. And I'm going to provide a column there and the port that I'm using. OK. And I'm going to um, uh, set up the username and password for, for my HiveMQ Hive instance of the MQTT broker, which uh, you know I'm not going to tell you what it is, of course. Uh, <laughs> and I won't tell you that the password is, uh, is 1234 either, right? So. No, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, and last but not least, I'm going to enable SSL, you know, because the, the fact that we are connecting to the port 8883 on the HiveMQ side requires us to enable SSL in order to connect. So I'm going to click on OK. And once I've done this, I'm going to click on Save. I'm not going to save the password for the moment. And as you can see, after I do that, I have this MQTT Sparkler configuration already set up for us. And last but not least, what I need to do is I need to enable the service, the data service. So it actually starts uh, the, you know, the, the data delivery and it connects into the broker and starts sending the data. And so as, as it's well established on the interface, it might take a while, <laughs> but uh, we'll get there. So uh, let's give it a few moments. So it connects into the, into the HiveMQ uh, broker. OK, there you go. Now we can see that the data service is running. And how do I know whether this is actually working, right? So uh, there's a couple of ways. One local is that if you go into the data service log, it will tell you, you can actually see that you know the, the, uh, the birth, uh, the birth uh, transactions have been uh, published into the broker. So you can actually see what's going on. It takes a it takes a while for, for the device. That's something that, that I realized uh, you know, during this uh, Doing this uh, live build preparation, that you know, it's uh, sometimes it's a bit of data on the login side, I think, and it takes a while for the for the group uh, to actually display the information. There you go. So, but it, it gets there. <laughs> and as you can see, uh, you know, we have the publishing notes birth here uh, at the very bottom of the of the um, of the screen, and that means that you know it has it, it, the device is connected into the MQTT broker and it has published the the um, uh, you know the different transactions, so it can start uh, delivering data into the into the server. Of course, on the other side, if I go into my HiveMQ side, I should be able to look at something coming through, right? So I'm going to log in here. Uh, cool, and I'm going to I'm already subscribed to any topic that's coming into my HiveMQ instance by using the hashtag. You know, and so I can see anything that's coming into into the broker, and as you can see, I already have this um, uh, this uh, traffic flow coming with data, and we can see that the topic uh, addresses exactly the device that we have configured. So that means that we, voila, <laughs> we have we have data up in the cloud coming from my kitchen in this case, and um, and uh, we can start actually using this data into the application environment. So with this being said, let's switch to Ecuador in this case, where Richard is going to be uh, doing the, the configuration for the different uh, features within the SCADA platform.
so to speak. You know. Okay. <laughs> I know that we're not using this ignition as, as an skater in any way here, but let's call it like that. <laughs> 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 okay, at the second part of this uh, live build, we are going to configure the, the connection to MQTT broker, uh, to configure the connection to database, and uh, to build the, the one a little application in order to see the data and, and get the data. So uh, first of all, uh, we are going to create the connection to MQTT broker. So uh, we have a ignition gateway from scratch. And we are going to, to configure the connection. In this case, uh, we are going to log in, of course. Yeah, set the proper credential, guys. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the best advice here. Don't, don't do it like ourselves that we keep, we keep using the, the basic ones just for them. <laughs> don't, don't try this at home. <laughs> so in this case, uh, yeah, we have here a, a message because the, the password is very, very high. <laughs> yeah, in, in this case, uh, we don't have, a, at this time, the, 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 the MQTT configuration because we have, a, we have a gateway from scratch and we have to install the, the, the module, no? So, uh, yeah, and for, for anyone that's not familiar with uh, Ignition enough, uh, the module that we're looking after is the uh, MQTT distribution, MQTT engine, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. which is the module that uh, enables the platform to connect and subscribe to any data in the different, uh, uh, you know, in, in any broker. So, uh, if we go into the previous question, you know, what type of broker should I have? If you want Ignition to connect to any broker, the way to go is by using the um, uh, MQTT engine module on your uh, on your uh, gateway. Okay. Okay. Yes. And uh, when we install the the model, we have the configuration part. So in this case, we are going to configure one connection to the server that is Hive MQ. And in this case, we have a default configuration, and we are going to edit this this configuration. So uh, we have to edit. I have the credentials here. So we are going to put one name. It could be any name that you want. In this case, I'm going to put the same, <laughs> the same name. We are very creative regarding naming, guys. So you can <laughs> <say>. <laughs> the URL is very important. Uh, if we are going to to work with SL, SSL uh, security, we have to put the prefix here, and we have to specific uh, these these prefix SSL and uh, the URL to the broker, which is exactly the same URL that we used on the up to twenty two device. So you know that's uh, that's why the MQTT broker becomes kind of like the heart of everything, right? And also from that point of view, uh, if you take a look at the uh, at how the, the the protocol decouples, you know everything. It's in this case the ignition becomes just a client for that infrastructure as well, and it can be any other piece of software that's subscribing to that data as well. So that's the power of MQTT in that regard, right? Uh, we have the credentials, and that's all. That's all the configuration. In this case, we have to save changes, and it should get connected. Yes, yeah. it does. Oh, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> that was the hard part, ladies and gentlemen. The the fact that it does get connected when you ask it to connect halfway across the world. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> the second uh, the second part to configure here at the gateway is the the database connection. At uh, the database, we are going to to send the data to a storage and history yeah remember <laughs> always remember that ignition is the it's very uh, database friendly it's natively uh, uh, created to interact with databases but uh, for that exact reason uh, you always have to have an external database at least one even if you want to have like real-time trends or that kind of stuff ignition requires a database to be installed so um, uh, you know in this case we are choosing uh, mysql as the database engine for two reasons, because it's really good, and second, because it's free. <laughs> so let's uh, 
<laughs> <laughs> but it can be, you know, any, any any database of your preference if you're, you know, because that's one of the, the things that we also see every day in our space, right? Um, this kind of like IT, OT gap is based on uh, different terminologies, different languages, because IT and OT speak differently. But in this case, you know, if you run into a case where your um, your IT implementation has Oracle to say something, you know, and uh, and you want your data to be placed there, as long as there there is a JDBC driver for it, Ignition will be able to place it on that database engine, which is really cool because you know if if you take a look at um, at the way that uh, uh, some other products might uh, offer you this, uh, it's always having like a like a, a local implementation of a particular. Uh, database engine so the, the the fact of taking the data outside of wherever you want to uh, put it and just transmit it into the it layer kind of thing becomes a project by itself so that's that's uh, these are some of the reasons why we have chosen uh, this approach and the technologies that we are broadcasting at the moment right yeah and that's it we have the the connection here the second thing yeah, so we have the connection valid. So that's step two. <laughs> Working. Yeah, and in this case, we are going to get the designer, the designer in order to develop the application. We have to uh, get the designer here from the gateway, but in this case, uh, we have already installed it at my, my computer. So I'm going only to. Yeah, we, we have so much to do on the development side, guys, that we actually wanted to save the 30 seconds that uh, installing the, the designer takes. Uh, that's how how uh, uh, how conservative we are regarding time on this build up. So, yeah, but um, in this case, uh, we have to create the the project. We have a, a default project that is the MES, MES gateway. This is from the from the MQTT module. This is automatically oh, That's from the web services module, Richard. Uh, it's because in this the gateway, we have a Cepasoft module installed. And whenever you install a Cepasoft module, that project is going to come by default, basically. And that's the reason why we have it. But uh, let's create a new one, which is going to be the one that we're going to be using for this application, right? Yeah. So uh, in this case, we have to put the project name. Uh, we are going to to select a, a project template in order for the time. We have a menu nav. That's what I meant, that we are going to be using out of the box kind of features uh, in the sense that you know we, we are going to use that uh, uh, navigation pre-canned uh, option that uh, Ignition allows us to use. We are going to be customizing it a little bit, as I mentioned before. But you know, why why to try to reinvent the wheel, right? If we have that, those resources available, let's use them, right? Exactly. And uh, we have to choose a uh, default database and default that provides that. In this case, is the, the default. And the default database is like build hist. So ah, uh, so in this case, we could uh, take the MQTT engine that provided and create the new project. Mm -hmm. All the all the settings regarding the tag provider and everything can be uh, changed, you know, within the project. But it's always a good idea to set them up from the very beginning, just to, you know, to avoid having to do that afterwards. So it's uh, I think it's it, it's always good to have that in place. So now we have the designer open there. Yeah, and uh, first of all, we are going to to see the, the data from the MQTT <laughs> broker. <laughs> um, Let, let's see if we actually have things working. So let's start from there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a uh, edge node, the, the connection that we created, the node one, that is the topic that Francisco public, and uh, we have the data, optodata and opto TV channels. So, so you can see that the different parameters that I configured on the EMU device actually translate into the, you know, into the how the namespaces for that uh, for those tags to be dynamically created by the MQTT protocol, right? So it follows uh, all that folder structure that we, um, let's say indirectly because we are configuring the protocol itself, but Ignition understands all that structure as the the, the tag folders for the different 
uh, pieces of information to be created, right? Francisco, and if I can it. ask, uh, if I can ask one question, if you were to add, let's say, multiple or more sensors to the current EMU, would it automatically reconfigure, obviously, like the connection to the broker, and then show up in ignition as like additional uh, data points, or would you have to Correct. reset that anything? No, that's exactly the, well, uh, it, uh, uh, what Ignition is going to be doing is, is it's going to be uh, subscribing to the data in the broker. So it will bring back anything that the broker has available, right? So if we increase the number of sensors, uh, then those tags are going to be available to be subscribed to. Ignition will do so and will create tag system for those, uh, for those uh, meters. And, uh, and and here's where the importance of having that structure on the name space uh, or this, on, on the naming for the conventions really clear because you can have as many devices as you want and you have to configure that on the device level as you could see at the very beginning. So the structure actually makes sense when you when you subscribe from ignition and you have this kind of like um, it it just saves time to have things organized. You know what I mean. So if if you uh, have that name convention from the very uh, low level, it will save a lot of time on the on the application layer. So you have everything organized and, you know, Ignition uh, takes the, uh, the all the work of creating the tags. Now, we have to be very clear on something that these tags are dynamic in that regard. So if those tags kind of like disappear from the broker, they are going to disappear from the Ignition gateway as well. And that's the reason why um, we're going to be work, uh, using um, uh, within our UDTs what's called reference tags on ignition, because that will enable us to kind of like dynamically address to the point of uh, that point of data, whether it's there or not, you know? So let's uh, let's move on with that, uh, uh, Richard. Okay, yeah. Does That's, that make sense, Matt? Uh, Did I answer the question? Yep, thank you. Uh, a, a couple of quick points while we're talking about MQTT, because I was just over here thinking that Arlen would be very proud of, proud of us. So if you guys want to listen to Arlen Nipper, co-founder of MQTT Talk, he was episode 67 uh, with Vlad and I. We talked all about MQTT. Uh, his demo is actually significantly better than this, but he doesn't live build it every time from scratch. Uh, so I would say go check out episode 67 from Arlen uh, when we are done with this. And also I'm going to take this moment to just say, hey, if you guys are enjoying watching and or listening to this, please go throw us a thumbs up. Please tell us if you like it. Live builds, as you may or may not know, if you're longtime listeners, you would know it's something new to us. If you guys are new to watching this, we are trying to determine if this is something that you guys want to see more of. So those comments and those likes help drive us into the direction of what you guys are looking for. Uh, and I wanted to give Richard just like an extra 12 seconds of of uh, vocal break for, before he continues to <laughs> go explain everything in the designer of Ignition. Back to you, Richard. Just before we do that, uh, uh, just before we do that, just a quick note there. Uh, you know, uh, uh, proving Dave's point regarding Arlen's demo, I've seen it quite a few times up to this day. And to tell you the truth, every time that I see his uh, his approach to you know showing how MQTT works and how par powerful it is, to tell you the truth, uh, every time that he clicks a button and everything starts to flow. Even if it's kind of like 10 or 12 times that I've seen it, I, I have this desire to stand up and clap just because it's really, really cool. So if you guys have the opportunity to watch one of his demos, please do so. It's really, really interesting and really, really uh, demonstrative of what the power of the MQTT as a protocol uh, has in the industry. Okay, so let's go on, Richard. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worry, go ahead. So in this case, we are going to create a UDT, only a faceplate could be to to get the data no? in this case uh, we could create a new that uh, UDT we have to put a uh, one name energy meter one uh, we we need to to make some dynamic no in this case we are going to create a parameter so Parameters are the entities that allows you to uh, make this UDT dynamic, right? Because we are creating a, a template, so to speak, for the for the data entity or the data object that we're going to be using for the different meters. So what uh, Richard is doing at the moment is creating that parameter in order for us to be able to create as many children from that UDT 
and each one is going to have a different value in that parameter that will be enabled that particular instance to be pointing to the different meters that are created by the um, MQTT infrastructure blood. So this is the, 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 other, the other side of the, of the configuration. So this is the way that we can actually kind of like link um, the UDT, the tax system automation, the kind of like the permanent tax system with the, uh, the tax that are coming from the MQTT side in the broker, okay? Yeah, parameter is the main part, I think that from UDT. So in this case, we are going to create uh, members for the for the UDT. Uh, we are going to create voltage voltage. Uh, this is a um, reference tag because we we get we are going to get the data from the MQTT broker. Uh, this is a float tag. You know you know how power. You can keep going, Richard. You don't have to wait wait for me because that, uh, uh, Clock is time is clicking, <laughs> but uh, uh, in the meantime, when you create those tags, the, basically, you know, um, the the thing here is that uh, you know how power meters are. You can have, you know, it's like a uh, like a, 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 drive, a frequency drive as well. You know, you can have like up to you know thousands of parameters that you can actually uh, be interested in logging and in getting from those type of devices. And uh, so in this case, we're you know just showcasing like really basic um, uh, variables to be taken from the uh, from the energy monitor, but you know it can go to wherever your needs and your application requires. As long as the device is able to publish them into the MQTT space, uh, you will be able to consume and uh, consume them into the application and create a template uh, within the UDT for that to happen. Right. So. Uh, I understand that the, the electrical world has a lot of uh, different interests on the analysis, and uh, but you know we what we want to prove here is that this type of infrastructure actually enables you to graph any of that data, uh, depending on the limitations on then again the meter that you have uh, placed on your infrastructure. Makes sense. Absolutely. And th th then if I may, um, to, to add to what Francisco is saying, that a lot of the work that it comes to go building a full on solution beyond just this very much kind of proof of concept is understanding what all of those parameters are and kind of understanding everything and what is needed for the individual solution. And I say that so that Automation Solutions Ecuador can go sell ignition development work that is more than one hour at a time, uh, which we will talk about later. Uh, because uh, otherwise people will say, Francisco, Esteban, Richard, you guys did this in an hour. Why would you ever need more than one hour to develop any application ever? So I, I say that and we'll talk a bit more about uh, ignition development, et cetera, um, as, as we get a little bit further into this yeah definitely so just to keep track on what uh, richard is doing at the moment he's uh, creating the, the dynamic bindings so all the uh, all the references uh, that these uh, tag members within the udt points towards are uh, based on that parameter that we created so the moment that we kind of like uh, manipulate that parameter value it's going to affect all the uh, all the linking, all the links that these uh, UDT tag members are uh, having towards the uh, tag system on the MQTT side. Okay, so yeah, yeah. So in this now case, we have the the UDT ready, right? We have already the the UDT, and we are going to uh, create an instance from the UDT. We tag a data type instance, and we have here the the UDT that we create. We only have to put a uh, an a name. And a very creative, very creative name. In this case, we are going to be creative, and this is going to be called uh, something like Australia Meter One or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like this. And the parameter that it's very important uh, in this case is the part of the path. So here's where we are actually linking that instance to the data that's coming from the MQTT uh, uh, provider. And as you can see, the moment that we create that instance, we already have that data uh, coming from um, uh, from the MQTT tag provider into our UDT, basically. 
we're going to type a name for the for the meter. So we have that metadata as well, because unities then again, guys, uh, uh, they all they enable us to get some data from the tax system, but also to provide that metadata that sometimes we need to contextualize the, the, the data that we're getting from the field as well, right? And we have so. the Australia meter one. Uh, the next thing that we are going to, to do is to create a, a faceplate, a template, in order to represent this UDT uh, in a more graphic uh, view. We have, uh, we are going to create another folder. In this case, is template. We are going to create a meter one. We get a flex container and that's all. We are going to create a little template. In this case, we're going to put the, the sensor name in a label. Where is, where is the label? Yeah, but before we need to create the parameter, I believe, Richard. Yeah, uh, we are going to create the parameter. First of all, the parameter. So for this view to be dynamic, basically we need to create a parameter, right? So we can invoke this uh, this view in many instances and, and we can reutilize it in the different pages that we build with perspective, right? So uh, that's what Victor is doing at the moment. He's creating um, a parameter for this view, which is going to contain the path for the meter uh, UDT that we are working uh, with in this particular instance. And that will be dynamic on the different uh, views of the uh, on the different instances of the view, okay? And in this case, we are going to use this param parameter. Yeah, so we're using tagging direction in this case for, uh, 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 you know, get the values from the different uh, uh, tags within that instance, the UDT instance that we created. And in this case, we're using the, the, the uh, meter name for it. And now what uh, Richard is doing is uh, providing some basic styling uh, for that particular component, for the label component. So we're going to make it look a little bit better. Um, and as you can see, we are going into the uh, component level for styling. There are several more options on perspective as well to get this done. But as I mentioned before, we're trying to do it, to keep it simple basically in, in this yep. case, right? So uh, we already have like a, a really cool looking title for the, for the view there. And now let's start with the data, right? With the data display. So we're going to start with the voltage. And, uh, you know, we've, we're trying to showcase the different type of bindings that uh, you can actually require for this. So um, uh, in this case, uh, we're going to be using indirect uh, indirection, basically, or tag indirection for the most of the bindings to get the data from the different tags. But uh, the different components are going to require a different type of processing for that uh, for those values, right? So in this case, um, what uh, Richard is doing is he's uh, preparing a map uh, transform, so we can actually have some uh, color animation on the on the gauge that we are putting on the screen. So if the voltage goes below two, uh, two, uh, 220 volts, or if, if it goes above 240, we have like a different color on the uh, on the uh, gauge itself. And if everything is within, you know, within. 220 and 240 is going to be just green. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so in order to do this, we're using this map transform uh, using numeric ranges for the configuration of it. And, uh, you know, just to make it look a little bit less aggressive, we're going to use, uh, use some transparency on the color so it's not that uh, oh, heavy. Yeah. Right. So. Francisco, and in this case, you can also trend the values, correct? Since you're storing the data in a database and not just directly polling the broker. Correct. And we're going to do that as well. But uh, at the moment, Richard, because this is live, uh, Richard misplaced the 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 uh, the binding, uh, the one that was meant for the color. He placed it on the value. So let's fix that. Let's go back into the into the value then. And uh, uh, oh, he already did so. <laughs> uh, we, we only had to take away the um, uh, the transform for it, and uh, the plain value is going to be assigned to that uh, to that uh, property. And I am going to put a button. 
No, I think that's, that's okay. So I am going to put a label to see the current. Yeah. Next, we're going to place the current on the screen. We're going to use a plain label for this, just because we want to concatenate, you know, the name of the of the variable that we want to use, and with some units at the end of it. So we are going to be using a different type of uh, not a different type of binding, but a different type of transform in this case. Which um, I believe Richard is a fan of expression language, which I yeah. respect. <laughs> if I would be doing this, I would have gone straight into scripting, but you know, uh, tomato, tomato, right? <laughs> That's the same. <laughs> yeah. The result is the outcome is going to be the same anyway. So, so you know, it's uh, it's good uh, options in those regards. So you can actually achieve the same result through different ways, and that's uh, also one cool thing about uh, Ignition itself as a platform, right? That it enables us to uh, to have different ways to solve things. All right. Okay. So we have our current, and we are going to put the energy energy value value. In this case, we are going to use some history data, historical data. Mm -hmm. so in this case, we have to make an array. We're we going to, to be showcasing this, uh, this component, Vlad, regarding you know, the, the, the trending that you were talking about. Uh, the, the framework itself that comes pre-canned from, uh, from the Ignition uh, uh, framework, it's going to already deploy kind of like that the typical uh, trending screen for us to, you know, look at the, the data, but we wanted to give it a little, uh, just a little bit of a different approach using this Sparkline component that's going to be bringing back data from the from the tag historian um, in this case, and uh, we're going to provide the last ten minutes of uh, of data uh, coming from the energy uh, um, variable that comes from the from the from the uh, EMU, right? Awesome. And it's also good to see because this is not a component that's commonly used. And um, sometimes I think that uh, people don't use it just because it's not that friendly to be used dynamically speaking. Mm -hmm. So that's something that Richard is going to be showcasing right now. So he's creating a structure because, you know, in order to make this component dynamic, we need to provide this kind of like uh, object uh, to be used within the uh, within the uh, the querying for the historical data. Okay, so we're going into the data property now, and we are going to set up the uh, the tag history binding for this. So it's going to be for the last ten minutes. It's going to be real time. We have to set it to polling, so it keeps updating. And uh, we're going to go with the expression language. Uh, uh, we're going to select that uh, custom parameter that. It's pointing to that structure that we just created a few seconds ago. And as you can see, we already have um, the data for the Spark line. Of course, we see nothing because at the moment we have no power consumption. So there's no, uh, mm -hmm. there's no energy measurements at the moment. Uh, we'll see that working at the moment that we have the application ready. Mm -hmm. When I actually turn something on in my oh. kitchen. <laughs> so that's in my bat. <laughs> we have to put the, we have to complete the bat. Okay. There you go. Energy. There's a lot of people asking whether this is going to be available afterwards. They, uh, I don't know what's. Uh, uh... Absolutely. Uh, so, so this, like all of the manufacturing hub shows, will be available live. Well. All of them currently, there is potentially something that may happen terribly in, in the future, but all of them are available live either through my LinkedIn profile and on the Solus uh, PLC YouTube channel. So we haven't said hi to all the folks on Solus PLC recently, but if you guys aren't following Solus PLC, it's Vlad's channel. Uh, it's Vlad's training site, Solus PLC. Absolutely go hit the thumbs up. Almost 38,000 subscribers on there, which, which is amazing. Uh, and so all of our live streams live on Solus's YouTube channel. Um, in perpetuity so you guys can see that 
If anyone has any questions about wanting to get the links or anything like that afterwards, please feel free to either send me and or Vlad a message. We'll be happy to go ahead and direct that to you guys. Uh, in addition, if you guys are new to the show, we go through the process of publishing uh, these in podcast form. We'll, we'll trial the live builds. I feel like there's been lots of talking, so we'll get some feedback. So if you're listening in podcast form and think that this is good or terrible, uh, please let us know. But we'll, we'll go ahead and publish this uh, in podcast form. And then we also clip up a bunch of things. Uh, so all of the amazing work Francisco has done with the Opto 22, uh, uh, Rio, Emu and uh, Richard is doing with Ignition. We'll go clip up some of those things uh, so that they're in slightly more palatable bites than, than trying to, to go take in everything uh, at once. It is it is almost like watching the Great Masters paint, watching these guys uh, go through and do the development work and then Francisco commentating on top of the development work uh, at once. It feels a little bit like a match, right? <laughs> it, it does. <laughs> to be commenting on some sports. Yeah. So, so I, I, I will throw out in there, for, for anyone who, who wants a little bit behind the scenes, I came up with a concept to Francisco. We decided it might be a little ambitious, so we, we tried to walk it back, and then Francisco's like, oh, we're going to finish much too soon. We have to go add this element, and we have got to go add these elements in there. And so so we, we have somehow come to, uh, to, to the, the beautiful thing uh, that, that we are currently in the process of adding. So if there are elements that Francisco talked about in Ignition and the designer that aren't very much used and we want to highlight, it's because they're not very much used and, and now he has something to point to of a, a great use case and a place uh, that, that we've used them successfully in the past. Definitely. So I believe Richard is ready to uh, place the components on the main view here. Yeah. So that's all yours, uh, Richard. So he's going to delete. We're, we're basically duplicating one of the main views that we have at the moment on the on the system, just to save time. And, and then again, we're changing the title for it. And uh, we're going to use uh, what's called a flex repeater uh, component within perspective, which is going to enable us to you know, uh, create as many instances of a view as required. And this is the, you know, the, 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 the way that we prepare this application to have as many meters as you may require. So at the moment, it's going to be only one, but it's already the framework is set up so you can have you know, as many as, the, as, as you have out on the field. And um, it only needs to be, uh, uh, you know, one, uh, one property needs to be altered to create more uh, devices, which is, you know, what's uh, Richard doing at the moment, creating the different instances for them. And you can create as many as, of them as you want. Of course, each one should be pointing to a different meter. We only have one. That's why when he changes the, the dynamic parameters, he's going to error. But uh, uh, you know the, the, the point is that you can add as many meters as you want with the um, type of structures that we are using in this application at the moment, right? So that's the power of, um, of approaching everything dynamically from the very beginning. Right. So last but not least, we're going to just to create some padding so it doesn't look that <laughs> that uh, rushed in the, in the visualization side. And um, I believe that's uh, that, uh, you know, that's the main view that we're going to create. Right, Richard? Yep, that's the main view and we are going to put uh, into the navigation in order to, to go to the mm -hmm. to the page. So I believe, uh, are you going to are you going to create the the page configuration first, the URL, or are you going for the uh, for the navigation uh, screen to be modified? Oh, okay, I already saw it. No worries. <laughs> We're going to alter the the, the navigation view first. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So what we're doing is we're adding an extra option on that navigation uh, view so we can actually navigate into that meters uh, main view that we just created. And uh, we are you know, changing the, uh, the icon and stuff so it looks kind of nice. Uh, of course, due to the constraints of time, uh, the application is not going to be that customized on the, on the styling itself, but you know, mm -hmm. it's always good to have things looking kind of decent. So, um, uh, we're going on that on that way. Now, Richard is creating the URL for this particular page. So we can actually access it from, uh, from the application that we are developing and from the menu for it. And only the menu. That's okay. 
And that's all. I think that we we could launch the application. Okay. Uh, give me one minute, guys, so I can give you some data to work with. I just have to run, as I mentioned, into the kitchen to make a tea to celebrate the application actually working. So give me two seconds. Fantastic. While Francisco is doing that, uh, I'm going to go, let, let's go talk a little bit about Ignition Development and Automation Solutions Ecuador. That is Richard and Esteban, uh, who are here helping to do this development. If you guys in Latin South America are looking for uh, folks to help you with your Ignition Development, this much nicer than, than this architecture and everything in between, Automation Solutions Ecuador, absolutely the right people to reach out to. We'll make sure Esteban's contact information is in there. I, I think he has come to the dark side about a year, year and a half ago, and is now officially the sales manager. Is that what I remember, Esteban? <laughs> he is the dark side. Yeah. Yes. You know, maybe completely technical, but yeah, one year ago, take the decision management. So completely at the orders, guys, if you want to, to, to check some projects about this, uh completely happy to, to help you uh, absolutely so Thank i you. i have a tradition of welcoming all of the automation solutions ecuador folks uh as they become the the sales manager over to the dark side so i've got to do that two or three times uh so, so congratulations <laughs> to all of my technical friends uh down in ecuador who have become uh sales managers at some point in the last couple of years i'll also say that if you guys are in north america uh, looking to do some work uh, I, I do work with the automation solutions ecuador folks so you guys can absolutely go ahead and reach out to me um in regards uh in regards to that we are always happy to help people no matter where they are because i think as we are almost done proving uh, development can be done remotely from anywhere in the world. Exactly, exactly. That's the yeah, we, we have developed it for, for Sweden, for customers in Sweden and other countries. So uh, the United States is, is, is the same. Yeah, contact, you can contact Dave, contact me. Uh, very happy to help you in, in everything you want to, every challenge you, you want to, to get into. Well, uh, sorry to interrupt, guys, but uh, water is boiling here. So, <laughs> so as you can see well, <laughs> on Richard's client, we already have uh, measurements. So you can see that's the, the the current going up, the one in green, I believe, and the other one is the um, the power, uh, the, the the energy uh, measurement from the, the device coming up. So Richard has set up a couple of access there, so we can have the uh, both uh, uh, both tags in context kind of thing. And uh, now it's the moment, guys. Let's see if this actually works uh, for everyone for, for everyone else as well. So um, I will uh, invite you guys to open on your browsers the link that I sent you earlier. So see if you have access. And. Uh, I already have mine working in Australia, so I'm, you know, it kind of like makes sense that I can see my own data here in the uh, here down under, right? But um, let me I just see the share times. my screen. So, absolutely, you can see it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and uh, here. let me let me go ahead and share some screens, um, and we can go ahead and bounce through, so you guys can go see. So, so Vlad is up in Montreal in Canada. And Richard, as we've been saying, is in Ecuador. Uh, and then Francisco is in Australia. And you guys will see that they're all very similar. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that they're all very similar uh, screens because you can see them from any, you, you can see the screens from anywhere. And oh, I just somehow managed to also push my screen uh, up on there. So uh, yes, uh, so I'm going to go. Uh, flop around uh, to the charts and open the tags and go drag and drop a couple of these on here. You got to use uh, uh, control select, or, like, or I could one go one select, and drag all or I could yep. go add selected tags. One of the two, but no, you guys can go see that on my side. And yeah, I think that th this is the uh, amazingness that is 
a, a cloud-based solution, right? There, there are certainly pluses and minuses of cloud-based solutions, and we can debate that uh, probably through the entirety of Francisco's day as it is his, it is, it is his day tomorrow. But th there are certainly uh, huge opportunities uh, of cloud-based solutions because we can go ahead and do the something like this from anywhere in the world. And then let's go. What do you think, Vlad? I think it's really neat. I like it. Th th this is a monumentous occasion. <laughs> Guys, we have made Vlad speechless for the first time in the last almost 250 hours of streaming. V Vlad is just playing around with this live application and is speechless. Congratulations. Well, that's good, and uh, yeah, and I think you can uh, share my my screen as well. I'm from Germany right now, so yes. if you uh, you can share my. Can, can you Check press the, the share screen button on the on the, the uh, restream, Esteban? Yeah, it's the computer uh, with the triangle up. Yeah, but uh, no, it doesn't let me share. I don't know why. Are you in Are you in Safari or are you in Chrome? I mean, oh, I'm Safari, I think. Yeah, Safari is not going to yeah. allow you to do it. Uh, yeah. Chrome is going to allow okay. you to do it. But trust us, guys. Seven is was yes. watching at the same screen in Germany. <laughs> yes. yeah, it's not, it's, it's, it's night right here. You can see it's, it's just uh, 11 in the night, 11 p.m. So. Yes. What happened? Scenario. Small technical hiccup. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. all of the screen, all of the screens went away. Uh, I looked to the other, I looked to my other screen, and then all of our screens were gone. So we we are back. But no, um, Esteban can also see the exact same thing uh, that we see yes. over in Germany and over in uh, in Europe. So yes. we have almost covered the entirety of the uh, of the world. I suppose we would need someone in Asia right now uh, to. Uh, to, to finish the the round of the world bouncing of the MQTT, and and that's exactly the power of the of the concept that we wanted to present today, right? Dave? And I think that yes. uh, that might bring us need to talk a little bit about Mapache uh, and the approach for the uh, for these type of solutions as well. I don't uh, I don't know if you want to jump into that. Absolutely. So Francisco, your your screen is up on the main screen. I'm going to go uh, bounce off a couple of these. Uh, Francisco, would you like to describe a little bit of what you're doing uh, with Mapache and the, the approach around that? Yeah, well, Mapache is, uh, is basically a, a software as a service approach for this. So as uh, Dave uh, has uh, well addressed at the beginning of this uh, of this session, if you know if your company requires to have this deployed on premises and you know data private, uh, they, um, you know they want to hold all the data on their own. Uh, scope and everything and of course they have the budget for it there's always um the option of going with the system integration approach and uh and uh and uh, and hold their own infrastructure which is you know something that they easy take care of but um in case that you guys uh, don't want to hold that infrastructure you just want to be using this on a on a kind of like um a user subscriber approach uh, as a software as a service as i mentioned before mapache is the the option for that and uh, we've been working with dave on that as well so you can reach out for him in case that uh, um, uh, that's on your interest basically so this type of uh, data collection whether it's energy whether it's uh, you know any type of device because that's also the proof the point that we wanted to prove um in the very end and uh, it's you know like they say what it's a cloud it's someone else's computer Basically, what is data? It's just one and zeros, right? So um, it's uh, it's up to our imagination to see what you want to be transported and displayed on your on your particular applications. But uh, uh, in this in that regard, and how to use it, that comes also as part of that imagination. So Dave uh, has been uh, uh, addressing this uh, en uh, energy monitoring requirements at the moment. So you. you know, companies can actually save money by monitoring in real time being able to compare being able to see where the uh, where the where the money is going regarding uh, energy usage right and that's a, a pretty common use case um, it's been there forever to tell you the truth i uh, i remember that the first uh, energy monitoring solution that i developed was on back in the day on rsv32 it was with uh, 
with uh, the old Allen Bradley's Power Monitor 2E serial communicator uh, devices. And uh, so that's about 20 years ago, to tell you the truth. And I shouldn't have stepped into that because now I feel old. But, uh, um, <laughs> but, the, <laughs> but the cool thing, guys, is that 20 years ago, imagining doing things such as the one that we just did in an hour, it wasn't possible, right? It was plain not possible. Uh, now, 20 years later, with the different technologies that we have access, and of course, with the right people behind the wheel, uh, this can be actually achieved in a very, uh, um, in a very successful way. And, uh, and without having to have these huge budgets for, uh, uh, for uh, you know, for uh, uh, making like huge projects out of, it, out of them. They can be really efficient uh, whether you take the approach of the system integration, or whether, or even more efficient, if you take the approach of the of taking a, um, a digital transformation tool that allows you to interact with your process and, and enables you to uh, take that infrastructure need away. So, in case that you guys have any any inquiries regarding, you know, the Apache approach for this as well, please contact Dave in that regard, and and he'll channel all those requirements uh, within the organization as well. Absolutely. Oh, Go ahead, Dave. Go ahead. Oh, okay, l l let me go kind of uh, follow up on, on Francisco's comments uh, with Mapache, and th then we'll let you go ahead and ask your questions. Vlad. But I, I was going to say kind of to, to parallel what Francisco is saying, I've seen many times over the years of a number of sites, right, be it uh, water wastewater or be it uh, a variety of municipals. There are lots of sites. There are relatively small numbers of tags. We don't want to go through some amount of custom development for that or we're a small facility. And the question is, wouldn't it be easier or could we go leverage a cloud based approach and get a dozen sites? Or I, I went and I worked on a project a number of years ago and the goal was we want to be able to capture like, I don't know, like 635 sites and each of them has a couple of tags. Right. We need maybe an edge device. We need something like that. And it all just gets uh, gets pushed up to the cloud. And then we can go visualize this all from one place. So I think as I look at the opportunities, there are almost innumerable opportunities to go take a, in this instance, an MQTT enabled device, go put some current transformers on it, uh, go set up the MQTT to the cloud and quicker than what we showcased here, which was what, 50 minutes of work, uh, we, we are able to go through the process of going able to, to pull and collect data. And then from that point, you can continue to trend and report and understand what costing looks like. And and then we can have someone like Vlad get into to power factor correction and, and all of those super nerdy technical topics that I promised I would tell Vlad uh, th that we would we would touch on. So Vlad, this is me touching on power factor correction uh, over the course of of this episode. Awesome, because um, it needed to happen, right? It did. Yes, <laughs> yes. It, it was in the technical requirements for, for Vlad is that we talked about power factor correction. Yeah. Awesome. So Appreciate power factor. There you go. Uh, Francisco, I wanted to ask. So you know, we've talked, uh, or you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I think that. What we've demonstrated is ultimately not uh, a sole purpose of energy monitoring, but can be applied across different applications. Could you maybe talk about different use cases that, or what kind of data you would be able to get from a manufacturer that would ultimately allow them to make better decisions? Maybe give some examples, obviously without naming the companies, but what kind of you know data you would gather uh, and then display in this way? Yeah, well, it. Uh... There's a whole universe of those use cases, Vlad, to tell you the truth. Some, we, ha we have addressed some of them. I think there's a still a lot of them that, have, that are not addressed yet, just because um, people actually are not aware of the technology that, that's available nowadays, right? So most of the com most common use cases is one uh, the one that we are addressing today. Energy monitoring has been there forever, as I, as I mentioned. That's something that's going on. Um, in different ways, in different in different platforms, in different flavors, to call it somehow. In this case, what we have presented today, I think it um, it adds a new possibility to the traditional approach to energy me uh, measurement, just because it actually al allows us uh, to deliver, to democratize, to unleash that data wherever you want it to be. But in that regard, as I mentioned before, this data is only ones and zeros. Right, so it depends on what we measure. So um, some typical use cases that we've seen out there is kind of like a, a environmental condition uh, monitoring, for example, 
for, uh, you know, for uh, uh, warehouses, you know, where you have to check humidity, you have to check, uh, um, you know, temperature and that kind of stuff, uh, combined with some notification levels and that kind of stuff that provides a really, really cool uh, thing to be done. Um, you know, it can be something as simple as, uh, in some cases, uh, whenever you look at the processes within a company, just leaving a door open might be um, an issue, you know, like the freezer door to be open. And the problem is that that freezer doesn't have any PLC, it doesn't have any automation, it doesn't have anything uh, connected to it. So the only way that they can actually monitor that is by one guy going and take a look, <laughs> right? And uh, so in these use cases is where the, you know, where I see IoT actually helping us because you know if you need to if you if there are variables that you need to control something on your on your process if you need them to uh, uh, put, you know use them on the PLC level to uh, to monitor and control that goes into the PLC and it might end up in the cloud through the SCADA or through you know whatever means you have but is all these use cases of variables that are not necessarily linked to any device at the moment and that provide that extra value regarding temperature, regarding pressure, regarding um, humidity, regarding you know, um, energy monitoring uh, that are susceptible of being part of this type of uh, initiatives because you are, not, you are not expecting to bring any control into them, but they can trigger things within your, your everyday operation that actually makes things better rather it can be you know it's a different approach because sometimes it's not again about producing more or being more efficient on the on the production floor it's more about having better quality uh, look after the quality in the products looking after on uh, of the different conditions that some uh, area should have in order to um, uh, for the process to be compliant with whatever you're looking at right so uh, i believe that's uh, um, that's the typical use cases at the moment, but then again, we are uh, enabling this technology for, uh, uh, in order to be able to open up the eyes of anyone that has the need, mm -hmm. so we can actually grab that data and, and, and make it, uh, and give it some purpose, because, you know, that's the whole point of this, right? Collect, analyze, improve. And, and if I may, may add on a couple of specific examples, all right, so, so everyone who has listened to the show knows that I've done somehow a fair amount of work, work in brewing and beer. It's one of those things that just continues to pull me back in uh, because in the United States and in North America, there are lots of small and medium sized beer companies that, that want to go do automation, right? So, so as, as they go through the process of, of making the beer, temperature is very important, is very critical, right? And so many times you don't have control systems and if you do have control systems you certainly don't have the ability to visualize what's going on in your phone so for those groups many times the head brewer is sleeping at the facility during the fermentation stage because if they if the temperature goes above or below a particular thresholds they've just thrown out 10 or 20 or fifty thousand dollars worth of beer and product and many times it takes two or three weeks in order to go brew a batch of beer and therefore become can become very expensive so going in and testing a couple of thermocouples or rtds and having alarm notification out to a phone allows you to quit literally sleep easy at night knowing that someone is watching and is paying attention to to your beer right another good example a conversation i had maybe last week is is greenhouses right especially in the u.s uh i see a lot of i was going to jump into that hemp hemp and, and <laughs> legal weed and and things like that and so i see lots of desire to measure temperature uh and then if we can measure temperature we know if the louvers need to be open or closed or the heaters need to turn on or not and again that that could if we were to look at legacy plcs and controllers and all of that become a very expensive solution but with something such as a, a cloud-based service it's i don't know uh maybe a couple of thousand dollars worth of of hardware and setup and then you are in the process of being able to go ahead and monitor that. And then you can have the discussion on control and all of those things. So I, I, I look at these applications like the opportunities are nearly endless with what people can leverage, especially to Francisco's point, if we can democratize what the cost and everything like this uh, is going into the future. And to Dave's point regarding greenhouses, because this is something that we were discussing about it, that's something that we are already addressing with uh, with Mapache, with one of the digital tools that we have. Because you know, the whole point here is that we open doors to uh, combine different technologies now available. Because we are, you know, on the OT side, we are 
pretty much programmed to use, you know, to think about a PLC, to think about a really expensive sensor, to think about something really industrial, to so to speak, right? But there are some industries like greenhouses, you know, that by the nature of the business, you know, these are infrastructures that are meant to be mobile, that are meant to be, um, uh, 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 you know, one day there and probably the next one not. Mm -hmm. So you you actually need some mobility on the solutions that you that you have. And uh, you cannot think about anything wired. You cannot think about anything uh, expensive either because you know it's going to be kind of like in the middle of nowhere and that kind of stuff. So um, in that regard, we have uh, we have addressed the solution by combining the smart cities technologies, you know, such as LoRaWAN and with the different sensors, which are IP66, IP67 as well, but it, they are not the typical like hard case um, uh, 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 stainless steel type of uh, uh, implementation. It's just sensors, IP67 sensors, uh, wireless with uh, a 10-year battery that it's going to deliver what the process needs. You know, then again, play the audience, right? And um, and those are collected via uh, LoRaWAN technologies and addressed into our cloud. So, you know, these are the type of, uh, of solutions that we, as Mapache, are delivering at the moment to make everyone's day, e uh, day easier, not necessarily thinking about uh, 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 an industrial process itself or a traditional industrial process as we think of uh, every day, right? Absolutely. I I think that th this has been fantastic. I, I I guess if no one has, has realized, Francisco and I have spent many hours, we might be in the days of our lives combined, uh, discussing uh, things along along these lines. And we, we could absolutely go on uh, forever. Uh, we had a bunch of great comments uh, in, in all of the chat. So thank you all for, for going ahead and doing that. Vlad, I will throw it over to you to see if you have any last questions before we uh, we, we say goodbye to everyone. Um, no, I think, you know, the, the comment I, that I will resonate with the most, Francisco, is that I think that uh, newer technologies are allowing us to make this a lot quicker, right? So as you've mentioned in the past, something like this would either be impossible or will take forever to implement. And now I really like the fact that, again, you've been able to implement this so quickly and allow us to see the data. Obviously, I think that the application can always be refined and you can make it look very nice and, and pretty with uh, with time. But I think it gets a really good point across, which is ultimately you can start making decisions fairly quickly and also fairly inexpensively, right? I, th I think we didn't really cover maybe the cost of the tech stack, but I think that if you were to do a very proof of concept project, I think that once again, there are hardware alternatives that allow you to run this, I, I wanna say almost, like fifty dollars, right? You you can get a Raspberry Pi that's connected to a to a sensor that is pretty much running the same type of stack that you've shown. So, uh, I, I think that cost should not be the prohibiting factor if you are, um, you know, at the very least trying to do some proof of concept type of projects in uh, in manufacturing. And obviously, as Definitely. you scale, you can always I again your database could be storing uh, obviously an increasing amount of data. If it's running on, you know, on a dedicated server versus again on that Raspberry Pi, so you can scale this application very well. And I think that that's also maybe an important conversation to be had if you are doing something in the field and you're going from proof of concept to a large, um, you know, ignition build that will monitor the energy, monitor your production lines, allow you to see some data maybe at the millisecond level, some data, you know, a little bit like on a, on a longer period, such as financials or, or business uh, data. So I, th I think that, you know, maybe in a separate conversation, we can also talk about how the scales as or where do we go from what we've shown here uh, and kind of apply it to a larger uh, facility, larger application and whatnot. Well, definitely, because I think that's a topic, as you mentioned, for a different conversation, because it's, you know, taking, then again, once you can unleash the data, what you can do with it. And that's a whole different monster. And yes. yeah, as, as they mentioned before, we started having like a few years ago when we, when we started uh, talking, I, I think we used to set up like 30 minutes um, uh, talks, like every once in a while. And we've given up. Nowadays, we have like an hour and a half every time, just because, you know, we, we keep uh, exchanging points of view on this and there's you know there's a lot of, a lot to talk about that because then again um the thing is that whether you're having an ot point of view or whether you're having the the the, 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 the traditional SCADA point of view right that's perfect but if you don't look up 
uh, as a system integrator or as a, a, someone that's developing uh, applications, then you're limiting yourself. Because nowadays, you know, the, the whole point of getting this data unleashed is to reach to the different areas on, uh, within an organization. And that's exactly the point and the type of architectures and the type of use cases that we can discuss as well if you want in, in a different uh, forum. I, I will be always glad to talk to you guys about it. So, yeah. So awesome. you have heard it here first. Francisco is committed to coming back on for an unleashing the data conversation, uh, which is the, the best title that we might have ever come up with uh, for one of these conversations. I, I, I absolutely look forward to that. Uh, we do want to be respectful of everyone's time. So I will do a little bit of wrap up. Thank you everyone for coming out to hang out with us. If you guys like this live build, uh, especially if you're listening in podcast form, please let us know. If you like it, it was a bunch of work from, well, mostly people not named Nate, Dave and Vlad. But if you like it, please let us know. Uh, we, we will do our best to, to continue to do a, a couple more, maybe uh, maybe a few more of these uh, this year uh, with, with some different groups. It has been a ton of fun uh, for us. We, we hope that everyone learned as much as we did. Uh, if you are listening, uh, please hit that like and like and subscribe button it'll absolutely help us out if you're looking for ignition development uh remember automation solutions ecuador i will say uh it is certainly the best integrator on this podcast uh, at the moment uh right uh but but no they, they, they are fan absolutely no but but they, they are absolutely fantastic i i have enjoyed working with them so if you guys are in latin or south america please contact esteban if you guys are in north america uh, please feel free to contact me we will all make sure that that you get taken care of uh, through the process of this. Uh, beyond that, if you're looking for a cloud service like Mapache, or if you're looking for something like energy monitoring in a way that you can quite literally plug a controller in, throw a current transmitter on a couple of places, and it pops up uh, into the cloud, uh, please take a look at Mapache and feel free to drop any of us a line with that. We will make sure that uh, all of the appropriate uh, connections and emails go to the right place. Uh, having said that, uh, Vlad and I will be back live Wednesday, uh, normal time, normal place, and we will be, uh, yeah, and, and we will uh, be here continuing our conversation on data-driven sustainability and all things energy monitoring. Uh, but until then, we'll talk to everyone soon. Thank you.